Hey everyone, this is Nick, and if you've been hit by the heat wave, get ready for another wave. But this time it's made of Linux and open source news. This week we have the first indications about Valve's new autonomous VR headset. We have Microsoft cracking down on open source app copycats in their store and their abusive pricing, and we have the Epic Online Services coming to Linux and Mac to bring crossplay between operating systems, but also between Steam and Epic Games. And of course, we have a ton more stuff to cover, like updates to GNOME, to KDE, a new image viewer and editor for GNOME, fixes for blurriness on Wayland, and of course, the traditional wine release. And we also have today's sponsor, which is going to let you get $100 free credit to start your own Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer, select a few configuration options and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment, but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. But please don't block mine, I'm just a poor dude working from his flat. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credits and get started. GNOME developers shared some more progress on their apps and underlying technologies. And this week, there's progress on GNOME Calendar to make it more useful. While the developers work on a new adaptive design, they added a new sidebar, which contains a small month view of the calendar and an agenda view to let you see what comes next. Something you can also get straight from the date and time indicator in the panel in GNOME. Warp, the app that lets you send files to a specific computer with a passcode, got some design improvements and supports mobile devices. Decoder, the QR code scanner and generator, now displays QR codes in black on white for more legibility and lets you preview the text content of scanned QR codes, which are all added to the history for easy access. Amberall, the music player, now lets you search just by typing without having to click on the search field and it can run in the background using the Sandbox portal. Bottles also got a new update using GDK4 and Libadvita, as well as performance enhancements and small interface tweaks. And Fractal, the Matrix client, is getting help from students participating in the Google Summer of Code to implement a media history viewer. Yes, I know how it sounds when I say bottles, but yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that differently. Microsoft updated their policies in the Windows Store to fight open source apps being redistributed as paid applications on their platform, something that has been a problem since that store opened its gates. You can find GIMP or LibreOffice or others listed under their original names or new ones for crazy high sums of money and in multiple versions published by multiple developers, none of them the original developers of the application itself. They won't prevent the official developer to charge for their own open source apps, but people redistributing them won't be able to do so. And they're also putting guidelines in place to avoid exorbitant pricing relative to the features of the application. It might look like a good move at first glance, preventing copycats that might have privacy invasive stuff added from appearing in the search results. And these apps also might not get updated as the original app does but it also directly infringes on one of the main rights that most licenses grant people, the right to redistribute and even sell open source software even if they're not the original author. They also didn't say how they'll judge which price is correct for a certain feature set, and they also didn't explain how they'll check which developer is the original developer of the app. Microsoft also apparently has a fast fund program that grants money regularly to open source projects probably mostly as a bid to try and lose the image of a big, bad, evil company that wants to embrace, extend and extinguish everything that's not coming from them. This fund is attributed every month by votes from Microsoft's employees. For May, it's GNOME that got the votes and the project was awarded $10,000. Previous winners include Systemd and Leaflet, the little JavaScript framework for maps on the web. 
Looks like GNOME was an easy choice this time as Microsoft software to test for Linux workstation compliance only runs on Ubuntu LTS. So GNOME is basically the desktop environment that Microsoft employees use if they want to use Linux at all. It might not look like a huge amount of money, especially for a company like Microsoft, but it could fund a developer's work for a few months, and maybe we'll see Libidvita recoloring APIs or accent colors or the GNOME mobile shell faster thanks to that. KDE developers also have a lot to share this week, and their work will probably make you very happy if you're a Wayland user. It looks like in Plasma 5.26, Users of high DPI displays won't get blurry applications anymore, as the team has solved an issue that made all apps using X Wayland, so X11 on Wayland, all blurry. These apps used the compositor scaling, which made everything look fuzzy, but ensured that all apps supported the scaling factor. Well, these apps will now be able to use the pre-existing X11 high DPI scaling, at the risk of the apps not scaling at all if they don't support that scaling. A new preference will be added to let the user pick between both behaviors. Other things include the ability to sort minimize tasks last in the task switcher. The cover flip and flip switch effects will now use the same blurred background as the overview effect, so everything is more consistent. And on the X11 session, you can now reboot directly from the message telling you you need to reboot for scaling changes to be effective. And as usual, there were various usability improvements and bug fixes. I think Plasma 5.26 will make a lot of Wayland users happy. I've been getting a ton of comments about this blurriness issue on high DPI displays. Still, that's four months to live with your eyeballs being completely destroyed by that issue. Epic Games keeps working on their Epic Online Services, which is their toolkit to integrate games into the Epic Game Store, add anti-cheat with easy anti-cheat, manage authentication, achievements, matchmaking, online chat, and a lot more. And this time it's good news for us, Linux users as well. While this new release only supports Windows for now, they want to extend that support to macOS and Linux. And the major new feature is enabling crossplay between operating systems, but there's also a lot more stuff. An overlay will let you bring Steam and Epic friends in one single list. Invites can be sent to Steam players from Epic Games to crossplay without having to create an Epic account themselves, as that creation will happen automatically in the background. And all crossplay features will be auto updated from the self updating overlay. That sounds really good for people who like playing online with their friends. Which I don't, because I don't have friends. And also, I don't like playing online with other people. And I don't like competition. Or invites. I don't like anything, I'm French. Gnome got some interesting mockups for a new image viewer and editor from Alan Day, one of the most prolific designers for Gnome. Well, these are just proposals, and there's no code attached to them either. Gnome has the nice habit of moving pretty fast from design to implementation when there's consensus. So there's hope that this might see the light of day relatively soon. This new viewer slash editor would let you not only view, zoom in, out and navigate images, but also access all metadata, crop, rotate and flip, resize, adjust brightness and contrast and markup images. It would also be adaptive, so it would run well with the newly announced mobile Gnome shell. And the markup tools look comprehensive, with paintbrushes, highlights, rectangles and arrows and text, plus a color picker and undo redo buttons. This new tool would also integrate really well with the new screenshot utility in GNOME Shell, so you could open a screenshot immediately and start editing, just like what macOS offers by default. So it's really cool to see better new default tools being worked on. Ubuntu published another blog post detailing their efforts to improve the Firefox Snap performance. If you use Ubuntu, you probably noticed that the default browser still takes way longer to open on its first run than it should. And while improvements have been made, it's still not great. The Ubuntu Snap team is looking at more stuff they can do. First, they're fixing access to various external files from the browser that was rendered impossible because of the Snap Sandbox, specifically Jupyter Notebooks. Firefox also defaulted to software rendering by failing to identify the GPU it should use, and they fixed the issue partially because there are still reports that things aren't perfect yet. 
They have identified a fix to prevent Firefox from loading all language packs at startup, even the ones that are not in use. And they're also making progress on enabling native messaging support to enable support for two-factor authentication devices and installing GNOME extensions from the browser. Other issues not solved yet are the ability to interact with network mounts, handling icons and fonts better, and a bunch of others. There still seems to be a long ways to go before the snap version of Firefox can even catch up with the good old previous package or even a flat pack or an app image. Still, these improvements might be avenues to explore for further improvements of snap performance for all snap apps, so maybe it's not so bad. Brave Search, the search engine developed by the company making the web browser of the same name, has passed 2.5 billion queries after a year of being active in beta. They also added an interesting feature to let users further refine their search queries. As they say, even if Brave Search doesn't actively downrank search results, unless the law forces them to, any algorithm inherently has a bias to show certain things more than others. And this new feature dubbed Google, uh, sorry, Goggles, lets you counteract that bias in the direction of your choosing. For now, the various filters are preset, so users can get a feel for the syntax that will be available in the future. And they let you filter by re-ranking content from tech blogs, hacker news, removing Pinterest results, boosting Rust-related programming content, removing copycat content like GitHub translations or Stack Overflow threads, or removing pages from the top 1,000 ranked websites. It's an interesting feature that might ensure that your searches are more personal and tailored to what you actually like to see, although it will also definitely reinforce the filter bubble effect. Looks like Valve is working on a VR headset to pick up where the Valve Index left off. Brad Lynch, a hardware analyst, has been looking through some files, and it seems like the name Deckard pops up again and again with a lot of text strings being added to Steam's code. This would be a wireless headset that works on its own, without needing to be plugged into a PC, which is cool. Valve also has a recent patent showing off a potential design, with references to antennas, wireless receivers, and a battery, which could confirm the standalone headset thing. There's no word yet on what it would run, but seeing that SteamOS is getting a lot of love since the release of the Steam Deck, and looking at the deck's success being the best-selling item on Steam for a while, I would be surprised if they didn't go with that. Other Steam-related news, the Steam Deck has now passed 3,500 games certified on its little platform. There are now 1,736 titles marked as verified, so playable without any issues, provided the testers did a good job, and 1,774 games marked as playable, so you'll be able to enjoy them but a few features might be too small or not adapted for the deck's form factor. New games added include Anno 2070, Moonlighter, Brawlhalla, or Pirate Outlaws. I would be extremely interested in a standalone autonomous VR headset from Valve running SteamOS and playing my Steam games, especially since I have no more VR-capable hardware since I sold my PS4 and PSVR. So yeah, we'll have to wait if that actually materializes and if it's good, but that's something I would definitely love to buy. And this time we finally have a new wine release, Wine 7.11. I can finally end one of those videos with a wine update again. In this new update, the Android driver for wine has been converted to the PE executable format, because yes, wine can also run on Android. GStreamer gets zero copy support, so media streams can be transferred without being copied in memory multiple times, which should increase performance for media playback. And there were 34 bug fixes, including for Mayhem Triple, Mafia and Mafia 2 Definitive Edition launchers, Saints Row the Third Remastered, Civilization 4, Cyberpunk 2077, Doom Eternal with ray tracing, Greedfall, the Epic Games launcher, or Ubisoft Connect. More awesome work to maximize game compatibility on Linux, although it does seem that Wine has really shifted focus to old Windows programs to games specifically. Personally, I don't care, I haven't needed to run a single Windows program on Linux for the past five years. And if that's also your case, why not just grab a laptop or desktop that runs Linux out of the box? From today's sponsor, for example, Tuxedo. 
Tuxedo is a company based in Germany and they make laptops and desktops that do just that. They run Linux out of the box. You can pick between a selection of distros at configuration among a ton of other options for RAM, for storage, for CPU, for GPUs, or even for screens in some laptops. But you can also install your own distro and get access to all of Tuxedo's PPAs or repos to just install all the compatibility things that they did to ensure that that hardware runs perfectly with basically anything. They have a huge range of devices, from the smallest ultrabooks to the higher-end laptop gaming workstations or even desktop towers. I've been editing all my videos from the Plasma 5.25 reviews on their Stellaris 15, a really powerful laptop that I'm definitely going to buy and use when I need to edit on the go, as I've done for the past about two weeks. So if you need a new device that definitely can run Linux out of the box without any issues, click the link in the description below and get your own device from Tuxedo. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. As always, you know what to do. Comment, like, subscribe, turn on notifications, whatever, or just dislike and comment if you didn't enjoy the video. Whatever, you're free. It's a free platform, sorta, kinda. And if you absolutely, truly enjoy the content that I put out on this channel, you can also help support me by clicking on the super thanks button, the PayPal link in the description, or by becoming a patron or a YouTube member. Both get access to a weekly podcast where I ramble about a ton of different various Linux related topics, or not Linux related, and you also get to vote on the next topics that I'll cover for the next month. So check it out in the link in the description below, and in the meantime, I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.